Okay, my name is William Gale. I know that you met me at the very beginning. And I'm the Executive Director of Anger Management Specialists. Um, and I really appreciate that you're doing this. And Catherine actually works for AMS. And um, since she came on, what, four or five months ago, six months ago, she's taking AMS to a whole other level. And I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I wouldn't be included here if you weren't helping out here. So I, I have a lot of appreciation and gratitude. AMS is really about dedicated to helping people cultivate healthy, peaceful relationships. And the way that we go about doing that is through using um, evidence-based, trauma-informed, and attachment-sensitive approaches. And that's a lot, and some of you may not know what that means, but as I go through this very short talk, I'll explain some of that. Yes. Can you guys all hear me at the back? Is that, is that better? That's better. That's better. Okay, cool. So at AMS we do individual counseling and uh, we just hired somebody to do Spanish speaking. So we do individuals, we do couples, and we do families. I've been working as a coach and a consultant for the better part of the last 25 years. Um, and in the last 10 to 12 years I've really focused on trauma. So I do a lot of uh, work with EMDR, somatic experiencing, and, and other modalities that really address the heart of trauma on a neurobiological level. Um, the program also has court approved and probation approved programs. We run a 12 week anger management, a 26 week anger management, and a 52 batterers intervention program. So guys that are convicted of domestic violence are sent to, to AMS and we put them through a year-long program. The 26-week program are for violent offenders who don't fall under the DV code, but they're sent to us to get treatment. And the 12-week is for the guys that fall under, that don't fall in the, under those two categories. And we're also doing teen anger management, and I'll go into that more because you do that. Um, Catherine, coming on board, is also doing the 40-hour trainings. We're certified by the What's it called? The Partnership to End Domestic Violence. And we're certified to certify other people in the 40-hour domestic violence training. There's been a lot of talk so far today about domestic violence. Um, and if you want to learn more and get a real depth understanding of what's going on and how you can be proactive, it would be great to take the program. Our next one's starting in August? August. August. Great. Okay, um, and we're also doing teen support groups, and I know that there's been two or three other organizations, and Christy, congratulations. I am so happy for you that, that you got that, because that is so important. And um, we talked a little bit just before, and it's like maybe we'll collaborate, and I hope we get to do that. So, and I'm also the executive director of the Seven Seas Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that works primarily with young men, um, both under the age of 18 and over the age of 18. And what I do is I help them connect to who they really are deep inside, their goals, their passions, and their purpose for being on the planet. And then how do they translate that into creating a uh, fruitful, productive, uh, efficacious life? And um, I take them to Hawaii sailing on a 100-foot schooner. <laughs> so I get to go sailing. So. We've been, uh, Catherine's asked me to talk about anger. So when we're born, and you're a little guy like this, how does it wind up that they wind up like this? <laughs> right? What's that? I'm so glad you said that. What did she say? She said she's seen kids that also can be really, really violent. How old have you seen the kids be really, really violent? Yeah, perfect. Think about this, guys, in the brain. I'm kind of going to go off a little bit here. But if you, if you think about the brain, if you take the left side, it's your logical, rational, compartmentalizing language side. You take the right side of your brain, it's more intuitive, it works more circularly, it does not know the difference between past, present, and future. Really important. And it's kind of where the home of emotions live. And then you have your reptilian brain at the top of your spine, and that's for survival. Fight, flight, and freeze. Now think about this. You have a child. Well, first off, between the ages of zero 
and three, 36 months, is probably one of the biggest brain spurt growths that a human being ever has. In that first three years, most of the templating, in other words, the neural networks that actually run the way that we operate in the world for later on, occurs in that first 36 months. Now, if you take a child and they start to cry, why do they cry? Hungry. Hungry. What else? Lonely. Lonely. Scared. Need to soil myself. Right. Now, here's what they've discovered with research. And I come from the old days where you cry and cry it out, you stop it. Unfortunately, when that happens, a child cries because it's a call for help. They need something. And if that doesn't get met with physical containment, not like, oh, it'll be all right. <laughs> Between zero and three, you don't have a lot of language, especially in those first two years that you're talking about. But in that uh, place of crying and asking for something in the only way they know how and they don't get that met, then they get frustrated. So they cry a little harder. So right away, we've already taught this child how to be frustrated. And then, the, it cries a little harder. But by this point, if nothing happens, they get mad. And if nothing happens after that, they go into a full-blown rage and they can't control themselves because they have not learned how to self-soothe. So in effect, when we let children cry it out, we're teaching them to be angry and rage rageful. And also create a templating which creates a belief system that I can't get what I need and what I want when I need it. So. Fast forward a little bit. You get the child who's been having this, this uh, template and this pattern of behaving, and as they get older, they learn that if they make a big enough noise, they get angry enough, or they put up such a commotion that they'll probably get what they want. Because we humans, we are masters at figuring it out of how to get what we want when we want it. Right? When it goes too far, that's when we have people who can get irritated and they get a little gnarly because they don't get what they want or what they like or something happens to the person who winds up in a domestic violence situation where they are battering somebody else, they're throwing things, they're blocking doorways, they're stalking, they're doing all those sorts of behaviors. So what happens is that we're, we're, when we're talking about batterers, we're talking about people who have neurological templating in their brain that is they have the predisposition and the propensity to be angry when things don't go their way. There's a guy in Canada and I just forgot his name but he's done lots and lots of work with batterers and part of his deal with this is that the reason people go to that level as well is because there's a tremendous amount of shame because when you think about it if you're operating in the world and how you get what you want is through being angry and being aggressive and being threatening and then you lose because you lose relationships, you lose jobs, sometimes you get um, a, a DV or a, a, another kind of crime and you wind up in jail, then these guys, and I have worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these guys, are showing up in a world of shame because a lot of them are actually really good guys but or and <laughs> they have neural templating that is moving them into a place of operating in a way that is that is not good for who they are and what they want does that make sense now does everybody have a question about that but they can be changed through ha! counseling or yeah something i hope yeah so here's my experience with this, is that I did coaching and consulting for years and years and years and years, did lots and lots and lots of talk, 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 talk. And what we have the ability to do is we do have the ability to change those neural networks. And if you do talk therapy, you can reduce those. You can get anger management techniques and learn how to be aware and learn how to be self-regulating by doing lots of mental gymnastics. 
but then you're always in a management mode because that templating is always wanting you to ap act in a certain way. Sometimes violent, sometimes aggressive. Um, Courtney, was it, from Domestic Violence Solutions? She talked about um, all the different ways in which people are controlling. It's all about power and control. Well, why would somebody want power and control? What? Well, they might be insecure, but why would they want to go for specifically power and control? What do you get if you have power and control? You, well, that's what you get to do, but what do you get for yourself? Huh? Mm -hmm, maybe. Get what you want. You get what you want. Think core belief. You get to be safe. So here's, so here's the next piece about the brain. And you've heard it in other presentations today where people have grown up in violent uh, households or in violent situations. And our kids are growing up in these right now. What happens is it gets modeled on a templated level on the neurological level. So then, you know, we were talking about video games. Well, if you play video games enough, then you're, you have a greater propensity to act out violently after. That's in research. It's done. Okay. Now, if you were the victim of, of a violent act, or if we're going to talk about trauma, trauma it, in, by definition is when you feel like you have been, you or your livelihood has been threatened, or the perception of yourself being threatened. It doesn't have to be real. It can be how we perceive things, right? Now, if that happens, and I'm, I want to give this to you an example, and it's not going to be a kid example. It's going to be a vet example. Two years ago, I worked with a guy who was an L.A. cop. And they sent him to me because he did a traffic stop. It was like the guy's light was out or something. He went up to the car, driver's registration, and within a nanosecond, he pulled the guy out of the car and beat the crap out of him. This is a decorated Afghani, Iraqi vet and long time on the force. Excellent guy. And everybody's like, what happened? What's your problem? Well, when we go through moments of trauma, our brain records it. It knows it on a very, very deep level. And sometimes the people that have it don't even know that it's in there. And then when something seems like it in the future, seems like it, smells like it, there's some kind of replication of that original trauma. Remember the reptilian brain? Mm. Wing. There's no left brain anymore. The left brain, logical, rational, I can solve the problem, is gone. And actually when you experience trauma, your left brain to a degree goes offline depending on the amount of trauma that you experience. So you go into your right brain, you go back into your reptilian brain, and you react in a way to try and protect yourself. Make sense? So what happened is that at the moment this guy asked for drivers and registration, a car went by and the sun hit the rear view mirror. His brain, through his eye, caught a flash. When he was in Iraq, he was at a checkpoint and as he was doing the checkpoint, he looked down and at the same time, they got ambushed and the guy in the car had a car bomb, like a bomb on him. And he was lucky enough to have the gear on. He turned around just in time, and somehow or another he came out okay, except he was burned all up and down here. So his brain saw the flash in the rear view mirror, his, and the reptilian brain reacted and pulled the guy out because that's what he did not get to do in Iraq. So, take somebody who's, with, who's experienced violence at the hands of a father, a mother. And they have the neural template that says, whoa, there could be a look, a tilt of the head, a particular posture. And, and, and they learn this particular posture, or this particular thing that happens the moment before they got hit. And sometimes that's repeated, but it doesn't have to be repeated, it can only be once. And then they get into a situation where there's a guy and he's with his wife and the wife cocks her head and she's mad at him and he goes off. The reason he's going off is because he's lost his left brain, he's in his right brain emotionally, he goes into his reptilian brain 
and he reacts in a fight response. Now, there's no excuse for that happening. And there has to be accountability. Because you just, it's not cool, right? It's just not right. But what we can do through what we know with brain research and therapies, so this is coming back to your question, are things like EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And basically what that means, that's a lot of words, right? What it means is people can get bilateral stimulation, so you stimulate both sides of the body, and usually I have these little tappers that I have that I give people. Or there's light that goes back and forth. Um, some people use like sounds that go either side. Uh, and some people use a combination of all three. And there's buzzers that can go in the ears. But what happens is that when you use something like EMDR and you activate the neural network that is at the root of the trauma, then what you can do is you open a bridge between the left brain and the right brain so you can give information to that neural network in the right side of the brain and in the reptilian brain that it didn't have before. Because remember in the moment of trauma, your left brain goes offline. So what we do is we open up the link and then we give it some information that it didn't have. And so it can integrate the experience. You desensitize that neural network and then you create another new, ne new neural network that will act differently and more appropriately to the same stimulus that caused it. So most of my work that I do with people is about creating space. Have any of you heard of Viktor Frankl? Yeah? Viktor Frankl. Guy in the Second World War. He was a, a Jewish guy, and I can't remember where he lived, but he lived in Germany, but he was a Jewish guy. Nazis picked him up. He and his family put him in a concentration camp, and what he discovered in there is like, you took my family, you took my clothes, you're beating me, you're insulting me. Not cool, right? But he's a psychologist, and he, and he realized that the only thing that he had was his own ability to think and feel the way that he chose to feel. So in between, a, what he learned was in between a stimulus and a response. How much time do I have? Okay, in between a stimulus and a response is a space. And in that space, I have the freedom to choose. So when I work with batterers, what I do is I, I do all kinds of things, including EMDR, to create space so that they can make a more conscious choice about how to operate in the world. And that's at the mental level, the emotional level, the physical level, and the neurobiological level. So we create new neural templates in there. Eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. If you look it up online, it's all over the place. <laughs> it's okay, cool. Um, let me see if I need to do. Ah, okay, so here's the thing: is that anger is actually really healthy. We need anger. Mm -hmm. Anger is one of the things. Oh, I don't know. No, no, okay. <laughs> I get angry, sure. Yeah. Okay. Who in here does not get angry? <laughs> you don't get angry? Up here. Yeah. Right. See, now here's the thing is that that's generally how it works. We either express it or we, or we hold it in. And the secret is, how do you be angry with the right person in the right way at the right time? Really hard. Especially when you're all caught in your neurobiology and having an experience that you're having a hard time controlling. Right? So it's how we express anger and what we do with anger that makes it positive or makes it negative. Okay? I mean, that's really the secret right there. And so, one of the other things that I do when I work with batterers is teach them how to be assertive. Because a lot of them never learn that. They learn that if something went wrong, they just either hold it in and hold it in and hold it in and then explode, or go real fast, real mean, real hard, get what I want and I'm good. And then have lots of regret later on. And lots of shame. There's a little triangle I want to show you. If someone's lead emotion is anger, anger, I want you to think of it like this. It's like, it's the defensive line in a football game. Because <laughs> that's all it really is. Well, it's not all it really is, that's not right. 
But really underneath the anger is usually, well not usually, always fear and sadness and shame. And then when that person acts out in an angry way, especially if it's aggressive, then they have a world of shame and then it cycles and cycles. And so they get to have negative belief structures that get perpetuated within their own brain. Yeah, well we all have triggers. We all have different things that will activate us into an anger response, right? And, and how we do that in, in all kinds of, you, you can name any kind of situation and some of us will handle it one way, some of us will handle it another way, you know? It just depends on how we're oriented and, and what our relationship is to anger. And so, you know, I don't know if any of you heard Ram Das, but Ram Das said a long, long time ago in the 60s when he was bringing all the Eastern stuff to the West, he said, you know, when you have a negative thing going on inside of you, invite it in for tea and make friends with it. Because if you're pushing that which is creating havoc in you away, then it has control over you. So it's kind of keep your enemy close, <laughs> right? And then you can work with it. And then you can understand it. And all of us have an anger style. And we might have two or three, but we generally employ one or two most of the time when we get activated in that way. And everybody has the ability to change their anger style through, you know, through some work. But I guess the thing that really I want to, we got to wrap, okay, is that, you know, I've, I've worked with youth uh, I lived in New Zealand for seven years and I worked with all kinds of youth there for seven years and I was part of the Academy of Healing Arts here for ten years and set up their outdoor program and we continue to work with youth. And I guess that at the, at the end of the day, Christy said something in what she was saying was that we have to give the people who never learned the skills or didn't have the opportunity to learn the skills and were templated in such a way where they act out in ways that are what we would say inappropriate and unacceptable, which is true, we have to give them the opportunity to up their game without shame. Because if, if we're shaming these guys, we're just perpetuating the thing that's going on and it never, it never gets solved. You know, when guys come in for an intake with me, one of the first things I say to them, I say, don't let what just happened define who you are, because you're bigger than that. And I always want to speak to that part of them that is bigger than what happened and what their egoic mind has caused them to do because they never had the opportunity to learn it and they never had the opportunity to have good modeling from somebody. I want to give you one fact, just because you wanted me to. They did a study a little while ago and they took people between the ages of 40 and 50. And they took all the guys or all the people who died between 40 and 50 of heart attacks. And what's going on with these guys? In 80% of the cases, and this was like a huge study, 80% of the cases, those people had anger issues that were tied to hostility and aggression. And what was happening, it was a di every time they got mad, cortisol was released, adrenaline was released, their aorta would dilate, get bigger, it would tear. The cortisol and the adrenaline acted like cholesterol and accumulated in those tears and blocked off the artery and gave these guys, these people heart attacks. So us helping people in this way is actually a health issue as well. That's all they got.